All right, today as we continue with our study on glimpses of the supernatural, we are going to look at an aspect of Jacob's life. And I'm going to pull out some details from Genesis chapter 31. Now, I have to admit to you that I am going to go down a rabbit trail. You know, sometimes teachers can get a little irritated when they have a lesson and, and students want to go down the rabbit trails of things that are just an incidental detail to the main lesson. But since I'm the teacher and I want to go down the rabbit trail, uh, we're going to do that <laughs> this morning. He will be irritated with us if you want to get back on <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, that would be my irritation is if you don't want to go down the rabbit trail with me, but uh, hopefully we'll do it together. Now, if you want some of the actual big picture of Jacob and his uh, the supernatural aspects of Jacob's life, I did bring out a couple of those earlier in this class. The, the two, two big ones, perhaps, biggest would be Jacob at Bethel, which is where Jacob's ladder's vision occurred. And I know that that's actually going to be part of the sermon today, the tie-in sermon with glimpses of Jesus is going to meditate on Jacob at Bethel and uh, Jacob's ladder incident. Uh, Peniel, you may not be as familiar with uh, that name, but that was a name given to where Jacob wrestles with the man who seems angelic and who may even be the angel of the Lord wrestling with Jacob personally, where Jacob's name changes to Israel. Uh, that is the second big picture or big supernatural event in Jacob's life, uh, I think. And, you know, there are a couple of others that we could talk about with regard to Jacob. He's like Abraham has a longer story with lots of opportunities for supernatural interactions in Jacob's life. And I talked about Bethel and Peniel specifically uh, in Hosea chapter 12 when we were studying the minor prophets, because those two incidents and the contrast between the two of them led into some of what Hosea is teaching in that chapter. So if you want some comment from me about those two incidents, Hosea chapter 12 video lesson would be where to go when I put the URL on the screen and it'll be on the YouTube you know, channel when it, it goes up too. So we're not talking about those two incidents though. Uh, we are gonna be talking about something that does relate to Jacob in chapter 31, I just want to pick up with the story at the beginning of the chapter because there are a lot of sort of details here that are really nice and juicy details to pull right up to the point where we get to the, the rabbit trail. So Jacob has already fled from his brother Esau after tricking him, uh, after tricking his father into giving him the blessing. Uh, and so he leaves, goes to spend time with his uncle Laban, and is there with him for a few years. Of course, he serves seven years to marry Rachel, then seven more after that. Um, and so he's got Leah and Rachel, Laban's daughters, as his wives. He's had his children at this point and is basically ready to go home. He actually has already asked Laban to go home earlier, but Laban says, I'd like you to stay longer, and Jacob negotiates with him and does stay a bit longer. But by chapter 31, it's kind of clear that Jacob has overstayed his welcome at Laban's house, and things are kind of getting tense, and that's where uh, we pick it up here in chapter 31. Now he, that is Jacob, heard the words of the sons of Laban saying, Jacob has taken all that our father has, and from that which was our father's, he has gained all his wealth. And Jacob saw the face of Laban, and behold, it was not like it had been in the past. And Yahweh said to Jacob, Return to the land of your ancestors and to your family, and I will be with you. So Yahweh basically gives Jacob permission, instruction to leave now. It's now is the right time. And Jacob had already been feeling that, apparently, because he's not feeling as welcome anymore. So in verses four through seven, Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flocks. 
I just picked up on that while I'm reading it, that he didn't go in to them in the tent in their house. So he asked them to come out and meet him with the flocks and in the field. Um, interesting little detail there. But he says to them, Look, I see the face of your father, that it is not like it has been toward me in the past, but the God of my father is with me. Now, you yourselves know that I have served your father with all my strength, and your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God has not allowed him to harm me. All right, so Jacob spends a little more time explaining and unwrapping things. I'm going to skip that bulk. I just wanted you to see he's, he's talking to the daughters. The daughters actually seem to agree that it's time to go, and, and they don't object at all. In fact, we read in verses 14 through 16, Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there yet a portion for us and an inheritance in the house of our father? Are we not regarded as foreigners by him because he has sold us completely, consumed our money? For all the wealth that God has taken away from our father, it belongs to us and to our sons. So now all that God has said to you, do. Yeah, it's funny that he didn't um, get mad at, at him because of the, <clears throat> the way he treated his first marriage. I mean, he said his wages were changed and that was a disagreement. How about the wife that was changed? Right, yeah. <laughs> well, that's been... Nearly 20 years in the right. past at this point, but, but you're right. I mean, he doesn't mention That's a it. Big deal. <laughs> it was a big deal. So. Probably not a good thing to bring up with the two of them, though. With Rachel and Leah, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> That's the point. He had both of them. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and look, Rachel and Leah probably didn't agree on a whole lot, but on this, they were actually on yeah. the same page. You've got all the best parts of what our father used to have. We're your wives now, not necessarily his daughters primarily, but your wives. So you're the man that we're invested in, and and so with us. So let's just go. We agree. It's it's time to go, uh, and no love lost apparently between Rachel and Leah and their father at this point. They're they're ready to go as much as Jacob is. So picking up uh, verse seventeen. Then Jacob got up and put his children and his wives on the camels, and he drove all his livestock and his possessions that he had acquired, the livestock of his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram, in order to go to Isaac, his father, to the land of Canaan. So you know, they leave, just that point. And Laban does figure out that they're gone, um, but he notices something in the process in verses 19 through 21. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole the idols, which in Hebrew is the word teraphim, or teraphim to be more accurate pronunciation, teraphim, that belonged to her father, and Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean. I think this, the, all the translators are losing out on the beauty and power of the Hebrew language when they fail to translate this accurately, because the Hebrew doesn't say tricked. It says, Jacob stole the heart of Laban the Aramean. Isn't that more powerful? Isn't that a better picture? I mean, he stole his heart by taking his stuff, but also taking his daughters and his grandchildren. So Jacob stole the heart of Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. Then he fled with all that he had and arose and crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. So Jacob, at this point in his life, always seems to be fleeing when he's going somewhere new. He was fleeing his brother when he went to uh, Laban's household. Now he's fleeing Laban in order to go back uh, to his father's household uh, in Canaan. And each time because he's been tricking or deceiving, and this time not telling anybody. Yeah. So here's the rabbit trail. Teraphim. What are those things? Why did Rachel steal them? What's up with these things? What is a teraphim? Why does it matter? These are mysterious figurines. I'm going to tip my hand a little bit at what they are with that phrase. Uh, what I would like to do uh, for the most of our time together is do kind of an inductive study as a group. I'm going to put up verses that show the teraphim being referenced 
And really, there are only 15 verses in the whole Bible that mention teraphim. And not all of them give us enough information to go on to decide something about them. They're just mentioned in a list of things, and there's nothing particularly telling about teraphim per se. So I'm going to bring up not every single one of the 15 verses, but I'm going to bring up a few of them and see if we can put together as much as we can from the biblical text what teraphim are, why they're important. And then I will, at the end, bring in a summary from a scholarly resource that enhances that with some uh, of the archaeological evidence that might bear on this idea of teraphim and some of the other linguistic evidence that may not be immediately obvious. And I'm not going to unpack all of that extra technical stuff, but just what the overall conclusion is based on it. But before we get to that scholarly add-on, I just want to look at the scriptures and what can we learn from scripture alone about these teraphim. So back in Genesis 31, the mention of teraphim is that Rachel stole these teraphim that belonged to her father. Now, there's not a whole lot there to see, but you tell me, what, what do we learn about this thing called the teraphim in this verse? Well, the translator thought it was an idol. That's the translator's decision, so I'm not going to stand... Uh, that's not what the text says. Okay. Um, the text calls, just calls it a, a teraphim. So what is... It's something portable, something big enough you can grab. All right. It's portable, right. So it's not like a house or a something. It had value, right. It was... If it was something to steal, uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a fork or a knife. You know, it was something valuable and portable. And actually, I, I didn't uh, highlight the portability here, but that is true. It was portable, but it was definitely valuable. Laban would miss it, <laughs> and Rachel stole it. And it doesn't say why. Maybe here. that was one way she had of getting back at him, because in the other verse, she, the way she was talking, she wasn't too fond of her father right then. Right. And maybe this was something he valued, and so she was taking it. And Laban, Laban and his sons are concerned or apparently upset about the fact that Jacob has gotten wealthy off their stuff, off Laban's property. And so most of the value of the field is now in Jacob's hands. It's interesting that Rachel is going to take one of the last things of value that Laban owns, his teraphim, you know, whatever that is at that point. We'll, we'll so unpack it a little bit more. Have they already separated the sheep? Yeah, that happened. That's how Jacob gets the wealth okay. from, from Laban and, and why the sons are jealous of him because the sheep incident where Jacob does trickery with the, the plants and make the sheep um, breed mm -hmm. modeled or whatever he wants them to breed in order to, he says, give me the modeled ones, and then all of them start having modeled children, modeled uh, lambs. So yeah, that's all already happened. And it's part of why Laban's family is upset with Jacob, because it seems clear something fishy is going on, but they can't quite pinpoint it because who can control the breeding of sheep and what color the lambs are gonna be. So. You know, they can't quite accuse him of anything, but they do feel like something is that somehow Jacob is taking stuff from Laban. Um, and so that's kind of where that is coming from. And that's already the case. So now they're leaving because of the animosity that came up from that. So let's follow this story a little further before we look at other contexts. Laban does figure out that his family's gone and tr traces them in some, some way. So in, in Genesis 31, 22 through 23, uh, we read, On the third day it was told to Laban that Jacob had fled, and he took his kinsmen with him and pursued after him a seven-day journey, and he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. So when they're gone, I guess it's not too much of a stretch for him to figure out what general direction they're going. They're going you know, home, back to Canaan. And so they go in that same way, and, and then they catch up with him in Gilead. Once they're taking all the sheep with them, I imagine there'll probably be 
wild. A trail <laughs> of dead grass. <laughs> Uh, no, there is no grass. Oh. Sheep nibble. Sheep nibble. Because we would see these sheep, and it's like, what are they eating? What are they eating? <laughs> yeah. There was nothing there. So, I like the reference to the third day. Yeah, that's an interesting because third day. You know, the third day precedent throughout the Old New Testament. Yes, on the third day comes up quite often. We could do a whole study on on the third day. That's another rabbit trail we could go down, and I think it would be a productive one. Okay, so here, uh, Genesis 31, 26 through 28, Laban arrives in Jacob's presence, and then they have this talk. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done that you tricked me? Again, Laban says, why did you steal my heart and have carried off my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you hide your intention to flee and trick me? Again, that trick is the same thing. You, and steal my heart and did not tell me so that I would have sent you away with joy and song and tambourine and lyre. And why did you not give me opportunity to kiss my grandsons and my daughters goodbye? Now you have behaved foolishly by doing this. This passage especially seems that stealing my heart would be appropriate because he's talking about being bereft of his family. I think we can sympathize with Laban. As much as Laban is sometimes the bad guy in some cases, I think we would sympathize with this. And certainly he is making a sympathetic argument. Now, would he have sent Jacob off with lyre and tambourine in celebration? Eh, I don't know. Is he being entirely honest? I don't know. But I think he has a genuine gripe to make even so. It might even have to see him go. Yeah, because yeah, he feels like Jacob's stealing from him in some mysterious way then yes, he might have been happy to see him go. Uh, well, and then kind of the other lower of the boom, and this might be what we say, okay, well, Laban, this is what you're really worried about. Because in verse 30, he ends his talk with Jacob by saying, now you have surely gone because you desperately longed for the house of your father, but why did you steal my gods? Which in Hebrew is the Elohim. Why did you steal my Elohim? That's the, the end of his comment. So is that the most important thing? Did he chase after him because he was missing that teraphim? Because this apparently is the same thing. His reference to Elohim and teraphim seem to be the same thing that's missing and that uh, Rebecca took. So what do we see in verse 30 then? What do we learn new about the teraphim in this verse? The religious object. Yes some sort of religious object connected with those supernatural powers that are called the Elohim. Uh, we know that Elohim is often used of God himself because he is the supernatural power, but all of the divine beings or supernatural beings, which we would, might, might call angels or demons or fallen angels, they could all fall into the same category of Elohim. And we even saw, when we looked and studied at the concept of Elohim, that it's used of Samuel when he is brought back to talk to Saul, when the witch of Endor brings back Samuel's spirit. The witch of Endor says, I see an Elohim in, in the chamber, and that was Samuel. So any supernatural being uh, is in this category. And so this teraphim, is connected in some way to the Elohim. And, and Jacob felt like uh, the theft of that was taking his connection to the Elohim away in some way. And he felt Elohim with the small e. With the small e, yes. Well, Jacob answers in verses 31 and 32. Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid. And this is he's explaining why he left so suddenly he says because I was afraid for I thought lest you take your daughters from me by force but with whomever you find your gods again that's Elohim he shall not live in the presence of your kinsmen now identify what is with me that is yours and take it now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them so and, and this is this kind of reminds me of Jephthah's vow when he says, whatever first comes out of my house, I'll kill it. And then his own daughter comes out. 
And Jacob gets himself in almost the same bind uh, that he promises to kill whoever it is who has the Elohim, not knowing that his own beloved wife actually has them. Well, lucky for her, Laban doesn't find them, but that's a spoiler alert. We're not. Uh, in, in chapter 31, then verses 34 through 35, is a little bit more. Rachel had taken the idols, the teraphim, and put them in the saddlebag of the camel and sat on them. And Laban searched the whole tent thoroughly, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let there not be anger in the eyes of my Lord, for I am not able to rise before you, for the way of women is with me. And he searched carefully and did not find the, the teraphim. Apparently, she's having a period, uh, and in, this is, in their culture, a taboo, a uncleanness. And so she says, I'm sorry, I can't get up off my camel, and you don't want to come near my camel. I'm having my period. And so they don't check the camel, which is where they are. Uh, so he doesn't find them. So what do we learn about the teraphim in this verse? They've got to be fairly small for her to be able to... <laughs> Hide them in a camel saddle. Saddlebag. Right. So if the teraphim fit in a saddlebag of some kind, they're not only portable, but relatively small uh, as well. Uh, you can't, I, you know, not just some giant bulge in the camel saddle. <laughs> like, look, there's a whole idol on there. Well, there's multiple. We don't know if it's two or if it's five. Yeah, that's true. Teraphim is actually plural in form, but we see that it's used sometimes of singular items. Sort of like Elohim. Elohim is plural in form, but it often refers to one God, the God, or can refer to one item. So teraphim, like Elohim, <coughs> grammatically, or uh, not, it's, what's the word? Morphologically plural, it's in the plural form. Like in English, it has an S on the end, we might say, if it's plural, but it's still used of single things, like glasses. Even though we call them a pair, we still think of them as one thing. Like here. Hmm? Dear. Dear. Well, and that, that's the same plural and singular. That's true. All right, so we learned that it's, it's smallish in this context, at least. Now, that's basically where I'm going to leave Jacob in that story, because that's the last thing that is discussed about the teraphim. J Laban doesn't find them. He goes home, and uh, <coughs> Jacob and Rachel and Leah go on their way. So that's the end of that story, basically. But we do see teraphim come up again, interestingly, in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 17, here is a story that begins with a man named Micah. The man Micah had for himself a shrine, which is tr the translation of the Hebrew, which means a house of Elohim. Uh, and he made an ephod and teraphim, teraphim, and he appointed one of his sons who became a priest for him. So here's Micah. He creates a house, which is like <coughs> the same word bet is used of a temple or of a house, and it's a place for Elohim. Now it's clearly not a house that Yahweh God has asked for, or, and it will not be his temple. Uh, so that's why the translator chooses a shrine. It's kind of a holy place, but it's not really worship of Yahweh appropriately. What's an ephod? Well, ephod is a article of clothing for the high priest. Uh, but it seems to be also associated with inquiring of the Lord. And it may be because the umim and the thumim are stored in the ephod. They're with the ephod when the high priest wears his whole priestly garment. But somehow or another, the ephod becomes associated with inquiring of the Lord and receiving an answer. We, when we read of David on the run from Saul, he has a priest with him, and when he goes to inquire of the Lord, occasionally the ephod is mentioned as part of the inquiry process. So it's, a, it's kind of a rabbit trail of its own and its own sort of supernatural thing, this ephod, and exactly what is its role and purpose. It's kind of like a collar. It's definitely under the total garment, but over the lowest garment that the, he wears, the, the priest. But yeah, it's one piece of his clothing, but also associated with 
understanding of the Lord's will. Uh, and this man makes for himself an ephod and uh, a teraphim. And then he says to one of his sons, you can be my priest. That's the breast piece that goes over the ephod. Okay. The breast piece does have the, that's the, out, the absolute outer garment that he wears is a breast piece that has the stones that represent the tribes of Israel on it. Okay. Underneath that is the ephod. And then under that, there's like a garment that he wears under that. Um, so, but this, this associated then, why? What do we learn is the, the teraphim is in conjunction with here. Worship. Yes, with worship, with priestly activities, and we see it as a kind of pair with the ephod. He's got an ephod and he's got a teraphim, and he gives them both to his sons and says, Here you can serve me as a priest. So don't have enough detail to say exactly what that means, but it is telling. Now, there's more about that teraphim in chapter 18 of Judges but only incidentally. It's when the um, Danites are looking for a new place to live and they run across Micah's house and they see that he has a priest of sorts. Um, they they want to take that and they take the teraphim along with every other accoutrement from this, from this place. But it's just listed along with them. So I'm not going to go into all of the references in 18, but they are sort of caught up in all that. Now again, later, we see a teraphim come up with the story of David and Michael. In 1 Samuel 19, 11 through 13, this is after David and Saul have gotten crossways, and then now David marries Michael, his daughter, because he killed Goliath. And so now David is in the household of Saul and is uh, living with his wife, Michael. But Saul is, in one of his fits, decides to kill David. And this happens in verses 11 through 13. Saul sent messengers to David's house to guard him and to kill him in the morning. But Michael, his wife, told David, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, then tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael lowered David through the window, and he went and fled and escaped. Then Michael took the household god... Again, the Hebrew there is the teraphim, and put it on the bed, and put a quilt of goat's hair at its head, and covered it with clothes. Now, before we talk about the details there, I just want to finish the story with, the, with regard to the teraphim. Saul sent messengers to arrest David, but she said, He's ill. So Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed so that I can kill him. And when the messengers came, to their surprise, the Teraphim was on the bed with the quilt of goat's hair at the head. So exactly how this all plays out moment for moment is a little bit odd, but apparently Michael was trying to cover for David's escape by putting something on the bed, the teraphim, and then putting the goat's hair on it. Now was the goat hair supposed to be like a wig to make it look like a person laying down on the on the bed? Oh, that's frequently how it's read. I, I read some scholars' commentary on this. It says, well, maybe it was just like a, a quilt, so it was like put on the bed, like somebody's lying here under the quilt. I don't know. But because she puts it towards the top, towards the head, it seems like it's supposed to be his hair. Somebody, I told a group of um, people that I'm in a theology Facebook group uh, that I was going to be teaching about the teraphim, and they said, are you going to teach about the David and Michael situation, I said, how could I leave out a scene that reads like a scene from a 1970s pop show, you know, a crime drama, where somebody's trying to hide and escape by putting up, by making it look like somebody's still in the bed, you know. I mean, it really, that's a kind of almost Keystone Cops kind of moment here, where you're trying to cover up by making a person look like they're on the bed. I can't imagine the touch and feel of this. <laughs> it feels like, it looks like goat's hair. Or I, I, although, you know, the hair back then, they probably... <laughs> he's sick. He's so you're not home, I get close to him. You open the door, you see he's laying in the bed. Okay, you leave. Yeah. That's the whole idea. I, I mean, guess, Ferris yeah. Bueller thing. Yeah, yeah right, right, Ferris Bueller. Maybe that's a better analogy. 
uh, for the figure in the bed that yeah, she puts. Any way he was worshiping that, was he? Well, that's an interesting question. Why would David have a teraphim in his house? That's the question that is persistent. Um, Doug, could you look? That's the end, please. Thank you. I'm sorry. Well, at this point, we're talking about something larger, right? At this point, and this is an interesting sized. point. If this is human size, uh, then yes, this is not the same thing that you could hide in a saddlebag. And that's really the only thing we can come up with from here is that the teraphim may be human shaped and it's bigger because it fits there. So th there is not one size fits all for teraphim. You can have small ones, you can have big ones, and, and you can perhaps have anything in between. So interestingly, but even the small ones perhaps were human shaped and meant to represent someone. Uh, so that's intriguing. And a camel bag can also be pretty long because camels are pretty big. It's true. I mean, it doesn't have to be tiny to fit in a camel, uh, camel bag, but it can't be life size um, without being obvious. So it's it's interesting. But let's. I'm going to quickly jump through a couple of other verses here so I can I can wrap up. In Ezekiel 21, in verse 21, Ezekiel is condemning Babylon and the king of Babylon. And he says here, For the king of Babylon stands at the fork of the road, at the head of two roads, to practice divination. He shakes the arrows, he inquires with the teraphim, and he examines the liver. So here, you know, the king of Babylon has a choice. He's going to use divination to figure out which way to go. And Ezekiel says he inquires of the teraphim as part of this process. So teraphim are clearly associated with divination rituals. Hearing something from the Elohim, it's just not representing the Elohim, but it's used to hear something from them. Could this be akin to the rich of Endor and the Samuel because someone wants to hear a word from the dead? And connection to the dead? I think that there's something to that. In fact, scholars point to that and to a, an interesting passage in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 24, that says, Moreover, the mediums and the spiritists the teraphim and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, Josiah removed in order to establish the words of the law written on the scroll that Hilkiah the priest had found in the temple of Yahweh. Here in a list that it starts with mediums and spiritists, which are clearly references to hearing from the dead, we have teraphim. And so some scholars would point to the uh, Ezekiel passage and here the second Kings passage to say that the teraphim are about a connection to ancestors to the dead and that's why you have family teraphim in your house so it may be why David had a teraphim in his house because they could run the gamut between being a, a representation of an ancestor that we respect and we want to memorialize, and so we have a representation of our ancestor in our house, and we call it a teraphim because that's just a word for a representation of an ancestor. But it runs the gamut from that, merely honoring the dead, to actually revering, worshiping, and trying to connect with the dead through divination practices and hearing from them. So that uh, is another possible connection with the teraphim. Uh, the, the, and this is the scholarly resource I wanted to mention, the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. It's a fascinating book, also a rather pricey one if you want the first edition. I mean the second edition, the current one. The first edition you might be able to find free on the internet as a PDF, but the second edition is pricey. But it says this, it seems likely that the teraphim may have been ancestor figurines which functioned in necromantic practices, that means connected to the dead, in particular, as well as divinatory practices in general. If this is true, then Rachel's teraphim, which are referred to as Elohim, could also have been divinatory in nature and thus parallel to all the other biblical passages, except for the ruse in 1 Samuel 19, which mentioned the teraphim next to divination. In fact, there are many interpreters throughout history who have asserted that Rachel's motive for stealing Laban's teraphim was to prevent him from using them in a divinatory fashion so as to detect Jacob's escape. Possibly. 
And why would we suspect Laban of divination? Well, because he actually admits to have done it, doing it. In Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 through 27, we read, It happened that as soon as Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my place in my land. Give me my wives and my children for which I have served you and let me go. For you yourself know my service that I have rendered to you. But Laban said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your eyes, I have learned by divination that Yahweh has blessed me because of you. So divination was definitely part of Laban's profile. Could he have been talking here about using those very teraphim to find out about why Jacob was being blessed and why he was being blessed while Jacob was there? Possibly. This is an oblique reference to the teraphim all the way back in Genesis 30. Well, I want to leave you with one last verse. Zechariah also mentions it. He says this, Because the household gods, that is the teraphim, because teraphim speak deceit, and those who practice divination see a lie, and the dreamers of vanity speak in vain, therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted because there is no shepherd. If there's one connection between teraphim and a modern application, I think the teraphim, which were speaking lies and rep badly representing what people were desperate to hear, we could just substitute television for teraphim in our modern culture. It's something everybody has and we all relate to. Just like David had a teraphim in his house, it was just something you had. But it, it's just a source of lies. And we need a real shepherd. I mean, Jesus almost quotes this when he is looking at the people and feeling sorry for them or feeling deeply for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He almost cites this same verse in Zechariah. Uh, we need Jesus. We don't need teraphim. We don't need television. We need Jesus to speak the truth into our lives. He is the source. He is our shepherd. We don't need to be like the people who have no shepherd uh, in this world. Let's close in prayer. Father, we so thank you for sending Jesus so that he could speak the truth of your words to our hearts and to our ears. Help us, Father, uh, to focus on him as our shepherd and to follow his directions. Help us to not seek out wisdom or truth from any other source, especially from TV or any other media. It all just twists your words. Even the people who seem to speak for you often twist your words. Let us listen to only your words in the scripture, only to the truth that Jesus speaks to our hearts. Thank you, Father, for, for sending Christ to be the true voice of wisdom against all the false teraphim in this world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.